Oh, cool. I, 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 are we waiting for me? Are we ready to go? Is that the time that we're at up there in the booth? Um, I kind of was just enjoying the crowd and the being back together, everybody um, back together, but it is the time. Um, so, so with that, um, let me say thank you all for being here. I'm Susie Silbert. I'm the curator uh, of the, the, the visionary title, Post-War, um, Time After War and Contemporary Glass um, here. And it is my complete and total honor, um, just total honor, to be here in this moment introducing this year's Reka Commission uh, by the exceptionally talented Anjali Srinivasan. Um, for those of you that come or that watch these videos, you know that I think that getting to do the Rakeout Commission is just one of the absolute um, most exciting things that I do on a, on a yearly basis. Um, it is such a privilege and an honor to um, get to be a person shepherding this museum's legacy of supporting innovation and choosing an artist an artist whose work isn't in the collection yet and whose practice pushes the boundaries of what we know or what we think we know about the material of glass. And Anjali is absolutely an artist that, ha that does that. And this piece, my friends, this piece does so much. Uh, it does so much and it means so much and it has so many things layered into it. So I am so thankful that you will be here hearing about all of that from Anjali herself because it's hard <laughs> to collapse all of it. It makes my job easier that you are hearing um, her speak about it. But I wanna just give you a little tiny bit of context for this piece and for what you're going to hear. Because I just looked it up today. I thought, when did Anjali and I start having the conversation that led to this piece? And I looked in my email and I will tell you that it was December 17th, 2019 that I sent an email to Anjali and I said we're gonna work on moving forward with this piece and we want it to do the museum wants it to do what you want it to do we want you to take on this incredible ambitious project that you've been dreaming about for more than a decade and Anjali wrote me back and she said wow you've really <laughs> made my 2019 <laughs> <laughs> Happy 2020, she said. <laughs> well, so you know, you know, and, and, and you know what it was like to be in the last couple of years as your own self. But imagine what it was like to be in the last couple of years as an artist, as Anjali, as somebody that's been asked by the Corning Museum of Glass to make a piece that's more ambitious than anything they've ever made before. And now you don't have access to a glass blowing studio and you're a glass blower. Oh, what are you gonna do? And you're an educator and all of a sudden you have to teach your students, you have to figure out how to teach your students how to blow glass online. Oh, oh. <laughs> and you're making an ambitious piece that has all these mechanical parts and wait a second, what? There's global supply chain issues. And not just like with the manufacturing but the actual boat is stuck. Oh, and those are just a few, a few of the hurdles and challenges that Anjali was facing during the making of this piece. So I am more grateful, more amazed, more thankful than I have ever been to be standing up here and introducing a Rakeout Commission. And I hope you enjoy uh, what Anjali has to say after she speaks. I'm gonna come back up here again. We're gonna watch a little trailer of uh, an incredible video that my colleague Brad Patoka and other colleagues in digital are working on. And then we're gonna go upstairs and see the piece in person. So without further ado, the lovely Anjali Srinivasan. <laughs> Thank you for reminding us of what 2019 ended like. Um, it's been a very interesting journey, and I am so delighted to be here, finally, and very, very excited to see the work. Um, and I want to thank everyone for coming out today. Um, thank you all for being here, and for the people who are joining us on Zoom. 
Um, thank you for coming here and listening to. Turns out Anjali's taller than me. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I will. I will do that. Is that good? Okay. Um, so I'm looking forward very much to your impressions of the piece when we go up. But before we head upstairs to meet Sans, I wanted to share its story with you. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about where it comes from, um, who its protagonists are. Uh, the paths that it has traveled, not the COVID ones. We're not gonna talk about the COVID ones. You know, that, that Susie's done that already. Um, and also the kind of dots it's trying to connect um, because my practice is very nonlinear. Um, so there are six chapters in the story and the first three outline some core values that I think are really important to my practice and the last three dive into the project itself. Um, so the first core value, um, objects that do not mind their own business. So, um, I was born and raised in India. I was fortunate, very fortunate to have moved around a lot. Um, and at least for the first 21 years of my life, if not more, I had the privilege of being inundated by a rich influx of material culture constantly. Um, I did not grow up with a notion of what art is. I don't think I knew or used that word. But I definitely recognize creative practice in every part of everyday life. So for example, um, this is a random truck that just happened to stand by me near a toll gate on the Agra Highway while I visited the Firozabad glass blowers. Um, and once I reached Firozabad, um, next to me was that long line of uh, carts with glass bangles stacked on them and this really incredible interlocking arrangement that they just do. Um, and this is how it gets transported from factories to the market. Um, and then when I taught at the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad, I noticed the street was taken over by um, kite thread makers. <laughs> this is the thing. The person in that middle image actually has glass and glue, glass paste and glue in his hand, and he um, runs that along the string. So the, glass, the, the thread is now lined with glass paste. Um, and this glass encrusted thread is used during the kite festival when they have competitions so that you can cut another person's kite in order for yours to soar higher. So, very ingenious. Um, notice how the electrician um, uses wire to sign his, um, his handiwork. So this is from my Chennai Studios main power panel, um, listed as a cell phone if anyone needs to call him for any emergency work. Um, this is from my friend Ajay Paul's house in Kerala. Um, Nelka, there is a very artistically braided bunch of dry rice um, patty that is a staple for that state. And it, you see it at front of entrances of most homes as a symbol for good health, wealth, and prosperity. This is a toy seller on the street carrying a very big fan that is comprised of many smaller sparkly fans. And they all just move and rotate every time he walks down the street. Um, so the drape of a silk sari, you know, um, hand-stitched leather footwear that shape themselves to my feet, or silver anklets that make a very delicate sound every time my feet touch the ground, sort of reminding me of my weight and presence on the planet. These are very minute but layered stimulations to my senses, and I just was living this constantly. It wasn't a one-time ex aesthetic experience. This was every day. Um, some more examples, flower garland market outside a temple. You walk down the street and there's just a sensory overload of all the different fragrances you can imagine. Um, so, oh, I skipped over that one. Chili market, you would think a red long chili is a red long chili, but apparently they're not. They're very different in smell, taste, and texture. Um, learning that materials behave in ways different from what I have read about. So looking at, um, marble in Mughal architecture and realizing that they're actually translucent, that marble is translucent and is used in windows. Um, or the brick and mortar um, that you build things out of are astronomical instruments, or used to build astronomical instruments at the Jantar Mantar. Um, everything is stacked and piled. <laughs> um, everything depends on the other thing's position. Um, you cannot move one thing without moving the other thing. So here are flower pots at a nursery while I was driving the highway, or um, vendors selling mangoes, pomegranates, and grapes at the market. Um, and then that's how a vessel store looks. 
And what's interesting to me is that the average consumer who walks into that store is actually able to filter through that maze and um, choose the vessels they're interested in. So that's the, the level, the threshold at which um, you function in terms of visible material culture. Um, objects that erode and um, grow from centuries of time. So these are temple stairs um, that are stained in turmeric and kumkum, which is vermilion, um, as devotees mark each step when they tread on it. Um, and over centuries, certain parts of the stair erode and become smooth because of constant contact with body oil, and certain other parts erode and become warped because feet have been stomping on those parts continually. This happens over centuries, but it's kind of incredible to walk up to something and see that visible in that moment. Um, on the right is a column, which is a flower drawing that I made. It's very ugly, but I made it, and I'm proud of it, um, that I drew on the floor using rice flour um, during the Festival of Lights. And on the left is the one that my mom drew um, with rice paste. Um, and this picture I took after a ceremony was over and people had walked all over it. And I wanted to share this with you because this um, erosion, this sort of disappearance of one's handiwork is normal. Um, it doesn't mean an erasure of something, it actually means an engagement with something bigger. Um, and that is sort of um, where I come from. Um, so given that a greater part of my exposure is all of these things, I hope you will understand that I don't understand self-contained objects that are complete and stoic and uh, everlasting and unchanging in themselves. I just don't get it. Um, so my objects do not know how to mind their own business. <laughs> Um, and they are not insular, and they want human beings to fulfill them. Oop, that did not happen. Um, so such, I, I just wanted to provide a couple examples from my practice, such as this arch that is made of glass filaments, and it was built by 247 people over six days in Dubai. Or this undulating glass textile that looks to the warmth of a human hand to engage. There's something very empowering about light emerging from the tip of one's fingers in order to dry, uh, to draw something. Um, so in ways such as these, the objects that I make need human action to manifest their being. Okay, chapter two. Look, we're moving along really swiftly here. Um, another core value of my practice is um, the importance of transformation during the making process. So my formal introduction to any sort of uh, creative practice looked like that. Um, I studied accessories design, which is a crossover between product design and fashion design. Um, and an important part of this education was uh, a solid, solid understanding of craft heritage in India. So we set off in small teams like this to explore traditional crafts across the country. And um, I'm just using that, oh, I'm just using Medinipur as an example because that was one of the places we visited. Um, so this is a dried bundle of shola, which is also called Indian cork. It's um, a reed that grows in marshy areas, waterlogged areas, and the xylem or the wood part of that reed is what the craftspeople use. The core of this reed is shaved into thin sheets. Then those sheets are cut into shapes and strung like petals. They are sewn to create flowers. Sometimes they dye them. And then they're assembled into garlands, artificial flower garlands. They're also used to make very large scale public um, sculpture um, during festival time. And this was before the popularity of fiberglass, um, as well as wedding crowns for traditional Bengali marriages. That is not a child bridegroom, that is simply the artisan's son modeling the crown for me. Just wanna make that clear. Um, so when I studied this craft, um, my mind was blown. Um, this was nature's own styrofoam. It was environmentally responsible, it was sustainable, it was a great solution to artificial flowers, large scale sculpture. But the thing is, I saw so much of this. I saw this in every village, I saw this in every material, I saw this in sort of all sorts of contexts that somewhere I started to believe that my value in terms of craftspersonship in a material 
is real only if I can transform it in a significant way. And so transformation became a core value of how I approach craftspersonship. Um, so I enjoy my processes most deeply when I make glass do unglass-like things. Um, for example, these quivering vessels. So these glass vessels are foldable, they're flexible, they respond to breeze, they respond to a poke, they respond to you playing with your hands, to contact mic sounds. An encounter with these objects really animates people. Um, and I found that transformation of this kind is really substantial and meaningful to me. What is, what is unglass? Un what is unglass-like about them? Um, they are broken and successful. Um, and actually, their fractured quality is precisely the reason that they are successful. Um, they're also elastic and shape-shifting, which is not the perception we have of glass when we encounter a glass object. The third value that I hold very dear in my practice is my attention to the particulate. Um, the minute, the insignificant, the almost too small to see, small, too small to touch what's closest to the ground type of information. So after I finished my BFA from Alfred, which is not very far from here, um, I worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I accessed the museum archives, and I spoke to scholars in the field of glass, and I was really puzzled that um, Indian glass craft traditions, while carrying really long histories and having... Um, prolific contemporary presence did not occupy um, very much real estate on the radar of scholarship on a global level. Um, and that seemed like a gaping blind spot to me because I knew of thriving communities. I had been there, I had visited them, I had worked with them, I kind of knew they existed. And still I had no knowledge of what their practice was like or what their life circumstances were like. So um, once I realized that Indian glass traditions uh, were not documented, and most of them were oral traditions or apprentice-based disseminations, um, I spent my time living and working with traditional artisans in India. Um, I used to work as a consultant to the Indian government, on in and I initiated design development projects for various glass communities. Um, so here's a short video of um, my visit to a village of lamp workers who make glass gemstones for the global costume jewelry industry. Every household in the village um, practices torch. Um, every cottage has a table, and each table is fitted with foot-powered air bellows. Every table has four torches, um, one person at each torch. Every person produces as many gemstones as they can in a day. And at the end of the day, they pour all their output into one collective bag outside the cottage. And at the end of the week or end of two weeks, a middleman comes from the bigger town and pays them a lump sum by weight of that bag um, to the family. So my job was to host workshops in which we would A, develop new designs, um, B, upgrade technology. So the top image shows artisans orienting to an oxy LPG, liquid petroleum gas torch, um, that would improve working conditions. And the image at the bottom shows bead makers um, working at a portable bead making furnace that cost about $50 in 2005. Um, this enabled them to build a thing easily, travel with it in the Indian railways with no problem, um, take it to craft bazaars anywhere in the country and do demos, and start to sell directly to consumers. Um, who would otherwise not have access to their craft, not see what level, and what level of labor and skill goes into making the products we're buying. Um, also, by learning to assemble the jewelry that using the gemstones they make, their income went from something like $1 for 300 little pieces or 10 kgs to about um, $3 for a finished piece that uses only 50 components. And the ad in there is they're training the other people in their family to do assembly work. So there's more employment, there's more income, and they're not relying on a middleman. 
Um, so this is kind of how my creative practice got entangled with social and economic empowerment. Um, my goal was that people need to earn a better livelihood through these interventions and that they should feel included and have more agency and more pride in how they practice um, in society. Um, and then, you know, every experience that you do with anyone in the world also comes back to you and you sort of absorb from it. Um, and so one of the things that came back to me is um, I really learned to appreciate the small, the teeny tiny, the base level. And it became really important to me that whatever I make should be able to empower or include. It should be able to make other things possible. Um, and that, and the way for me to do that, this is the only way I knew, I'm sure there are other ways out there, but the way for me to do that was to pay attention to what is closest to my hand, what is closest to the ground. What is the smallest element of something that I am dealing with? What is the particle of my activity? Um, what is that fundamental element or factor that if I switch on, if I turn it around, it can be impactful in a significant way? So all my energies when I'm making something goes towards identifying that little particle. Um, and since then, I have used the metaphor of a particle to shape my approach. And sometimes I, I literalize, is that a word? Um, it is now, okay? I, 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 I literalize the way a particle behaves in my material process. For example, um, in 2005, I landed up developing a porous, lightweight material called puffy glass. Well. Um, because it's fluffy and full of air pockets. Um, it also carves with an X-Acto knife and looks like bread, pretty cool. And Marshall here has chocolate-covered puffy glass, apparently still, so that's pretty awesome. Um, why did this thing come about? Um, I am not a scientist, I am not a chemist. There's no reason for me to go into material development. Um, when I worked with artisans, um, one of the um, critiques that I heard very often was this was an unequal partnership for various reasons because we were not from the same background. Um, and I considered this idea, and I was very offended and very agitated with it. And I said, OK, you know what? Fine, it's an unequal partnership. Let's see what wonderful things can come out of unequal partnerships. So I took a high maintenance particle, like glass, it's heavily machined, heavily heavy infrastructure. And I took a low tech particle, like flour, housewife material to make bread. And I smushed them together and kneaded them, kneaded them. And I fired them together. and um, I got that. <laughs> so um, to me, it just seemed like puffy glass came out of this une so-called unequal partnership, but is an incredibly curious and wondrous, wondrous uh, material. And um, I often think of um, I often think of imagination as the moment where all knowledge systems come together, and then you still fail to comprehend the thing that you made. And puffy glass was that moment for me. And that's when I knew this approach of particle was really right for me. Um, so puffy glass, ha, 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 when in it's not fired, can grow mold. So then I was like, oh, can it actually grow plants? Hmm. So I worked with soil research scientists in Sydney University to study puffy glass for its ability um, to act as soil substrate to grow, pl grow plant matter. And I envisioned, this is just a thought, I was like, oh, it would be so cool if the pores of my glass would allow plant roots to run through the material in the way that you know trees overtake ruins and run through, and the ruins are only held by the tree. That would be amazing. So could nutrients in the surroundings um, climb up by capillary action and the roots sort of get enticed? But then I started pushing that more. And this is a fairly recent development thanks to COVID. You know, we all have time to daydream a lot, so. Um, could the glass provide nutrients to the plants? Um, so this is aiming, aiming, aiming to be a recipe for glass that can be sculpted, but can host uh, plant life within or on it, which means it can feed the plant nutrients by degrading itself over a period of time. So think of it as a zero residue glass that would allow centuries of craftspersonship and human knowledge to all move forward while responding to climate change and environmental crisis. Um, why should our objects outlive us? And also, can I make objects that give themselves up for a life form to thrive instead? 
So this, this is kind of what I'm daydreaming about these days. Um, but it all comes from me just paying attention to the thing that I can't really put my finger on, the thing that's too small, but the thing that could happen. Um, oh, chapter four, look at that. Okay, let's talk about the Shish Mahal. Um, so I would like to introduce you now to the Shish Mahal um, through a very short cinematic rendition um, showing you the optical effects within these chambers. Um, it is set in the tragic love story of a courtesan and a Mughal prince. She says, why fear if you're in love? Why should we be afraid if we have loved? Our love cannot be hidden. It surrounds you in all directions and it can be seen everywhere. Um, and a few other choice phrases that caused the emperor at the end to turn a completely different color and then come to the decision that he's going to bury her alive behind the walls of the Shish Mahal. Side note, you know, we don't worry about that right now, but th that's how the story goes. Um, but as you saw, this was an intricate surface composed of mirrored glass. And each shard miniaturizes the image of the person standing in that chamber to a mite-sized particle of dust. Um, and at the same time, that self-image is multiplied endless number of times all over the space. So when the person moves, their movement is magnified like a cascading effect. I love that the film appropriated the optical phenomenon of the Shishmael's mirrored walls to speak about devo devout and defiant love and sort of the spirit of um, the brave actions of love. Um, but it's also a really powerful and potent and beautifully poetic thought that a static person disappears and doesn't make a difference. But if one moves or is moved by something, the effect is transformatory. If we don't reach out and touch something around us, we are not going to affect change. So I first encountered the Shish Mahal as a child during visits to Rajasthan, and I clearly remember my awe um, for what, what I felt like when I visited um, these monuments. Um, it was much later that I actually researched the tradition and learned more. So each glass mosaic in these chambers um, is reflective and convex. Um, this causes the reflection to be cumulative as an add-on um, and not fragmentary. So if you take a flat piece of glass and shatter it and then expect it to do this, it won't. It'll just break that reflection up into parts. But because these are convex lenses, they multiply the image. Um, and to do this historically, artisans silvered the inside of thin blown glass spheres, and these objects were broken and then cut into pieces of various sizes by a uh, group of people. And then each fragment was embedded by hand into a wall with plaster surrounding it in those patterns by a different community of artisans. So while a shish mahal looks like this during the day, it's a glittering, you know, splendorous thing, um, at night, it turns into this hypnotic starry night and the stars follow your hand because you're holding a lamp in it. Sadly, the Shish Mahal became obsolete with the decline of the Mughal rule and the coming of the British. Um, the craft lost uh, patronage and people who would support the labor-intensive process of manufacture. Um, it disappeared into oblivion, and now you see it in ruins and monuments and old palaces. The last... Um, in 2000, 2001, um, Gujarat had earthquakes, and um, when I was trying to locate the communities that used to work on this craft tradition, um, I learned that those communities were disbanded from, from the earthquakes after effects. So I have not been able to find those people since then. Although Susie was telling me that potentially something's out there. I'm going back to India to find out. Maybe, you know. 
Um, but that was the last sort of rumored instance where I heard that community was alive. But since then, um, I have seen no evidence of it, and that group of people is disbanded. So the reality of a person's experience of the Shishmal is this. This was in 2020, right before COVID happened. Um, it's visible to the eye. So the Shishmal is the dark room right at the back. That's the Shishmal inside. You cannot even see it. You see some sparkle, and that's about it. So you, it's visible to the eye as some sort of like interior decor thing. Um, but it's completely inaccessible to the body, and it is not the kind of space that you can absorb anymore. Um, it is, you don't have the direct experience, you don't have the activated stimulation from that space. Um, so my challenge is, has been how to bring to life that dead paradigm. Um, how do I make the Shish Mahal relevant to the here and now? I started by encrusting discarded objects with convex mirrored glass shards. This is a milk gallon container, yeah, grocery store. Um, you see how the light multiplies. But what I discovered in addition to that is there is this almost reptilian skin that starts to appear just because I did a shitty job of putting those things there. Um, and also, this skin starts to flex when my hand touches the surface because the milk jar is flexible. Um, and so the flexibility of that wall acting like skin veered me away from these types of translations that I was also attempting. And I started to focus a lot more on play. Um, this is me being really silly. But it's also very truthful about my plans to sort of particularize everything around me, to see everything around me like the Shishmahal. So what if the only way I could see the world is in miniature and multiplication? No object, only pattern. What does that do? Um, so I was playing around with those types of ideas. And then what if steel platters from those vessel stores that I showed you pictures of, what if those steel platters were encrusted with glass components that were shaped so they could actually have reflections in the way that they needed to. Um, and then what if those glass mosaics, which were really objects, um, were concave instead of convex? So what if within that void and the self-image disappearing, there was no multiplication? What if you just removed all the reflections? It was shiny and reflective, but you can actually see yourself. What kind of frustration sets in then? Um, at one point, I started my ceiling with glass balls um, and turned the lights off with one candle underneath um, and then had my friend Carmen Montoya dance under it like a crazy person. And um, with a person dancing while holding a, a light in the palm of their hands, this is what happened. It was as though the night sky above us was dancing with our movements. It was like we affected the stars. We could draw between them. We could create our own constellations. And so that's kind of what I did. So the image on the right, um, I started to look at the, the stars of this installation as starting points. And then I started building three-dimensional um, faceted offshoots using borosilicate rod. And curiously, the flat shadows cast by those stable structures started to speak about fractures and breaks, like cracks on parched land. So I was looking at these three-dimensional, very stable things, but what really interested me was that sort of breakage that's happening down below and doesn't really mean anything. And then I started to think about why breakage should be look, looked at differently. If I could look at those fractures as thresholds for shifting something, for moving something, those breaks could be really, really productive. So what if the object that reflects us, responds to us instead. What if instead of showing me to me, it shows me what it can do? Um, this is a cracked blob, a nondescript object on a pedestal. And as the person approaches the piece, she sees her reflection in the glass. And um, when the person is close enough or touches it, the object very subtly expands and contracts as though it's breathing. So this is one other realization I came to um, through my experiments. Haptic was not enough. Um, works needed to engage with their surroundings in um, a way that we are engaged in, 
in our lives, um, and I must think of my objects as beings. In 2009, I co-curated an exhibition, actually here in Corning, um, in spaces all across Market Street, um, showing works about 30 artists, and we call them post-class artists. Um, we use the term post-class because they were emerging artists who were making glass that was undeniably, inextricably rooted in the discipline and deep understanding of glass, but the outcomes existed outside the contemporary discourse of studio glass. Um, and so as, as the curator of the show, I greeted the guests who came into the space um, with a handshake wearing that glove, the skin tone glove. Um, it was lined with glass on the inside of my hand. And it turned this otherwise warm and friendly en encounter that we all take for granted into a very cold, crunchy, and awkward one that needed people to pause and really l not make eye contact but look at what was happening to their hand instead. Um, so uh, at the top, uh, on the left is the glove when I started out, and on the right is the glove after 42 handshakes. It wore down, it aged, it grew tired. Um, this was fascinating to me because, um, you know, we do that too. We get tired after shaking hands 42 times, just saying. Um, then I decided I'm going to be the walking, talking shish mahal. So these are a couple glass dresses that um, I cast around my body. They're tailored to fit me. They have a concealed zipper. They're very comfortable, heavy, but comfortable. And most curiously, they shed glass like dead skin cells as I walk and turn and bend and sit and stand. It's very exciting for anyone who's standing around me. Um, so the dress embodies the optics of the tradition I wanted to bring, in li bring to life, but it is also very relevant as a social experiment. So I would wear this for different occasions. I would wear it at lunch meetings, exhibit openings, just the random street, um, strolls around the city, classroom, that kind of thing. And what happens is that people look at me, they find themselves reflected in me, um, our tendency is always to reach out for a reflection of ourselves, so they do that, and then they realize they're touching the body of a foreign brown woman, that, that is a highly, highly inappropriate thing to do in public space, and then there's this really awkward boundary that's set up, but they've already breached it, and now they have to like sort of salvage that, and then, then stuff, we just start talking about things. Icebreaker. Um, so, um, I started making works that basically provided a zone that people needed to negotiate. It wasn't a given as to what the thing was. Um, in the last two years, I have found myself returning to flatness, to the skinness um, as it relates to our perception of a wall. So wall, membrane, skin, that kind of thing. I also took up wood burning during COVID because I didn't really have access to studios. Um, and there was just something about the slow boring of material with heat and pressure. You know, material destroyed as it emits smoke and a mark left by deadness. Um, and I haven't quite figured out what that is yet, but I'm going to keep doing it till it comes to me. Um, but there is something there that's very interesting. So the fronts of these work um, look like glass skin, and the backs are intricate wood burn pan pan patterns in Mughal style. This was the same time I was having a conversation with Susie, and we're like, oh, let's make a breathing glass wall. Um, so it, it's going to be a reflective, cracked wall that has signs of life within it. And, and it was very clear that I didn't want to represent, imitate, mimic, or document the thing that we have already lost. Um, I wanted to transform it and offer people a new way of connecting with it. And so it came about, the 35th Breakout Commission in 2020. Um, title sounds Eyes of the Skin. So from the beginning, I was holding close the analogous relationship between this work and the human body. Um, this wall was going to be composed of cells, not floral and geometric patterns that were the shish mahal. And so my first step was, ooh, I have to blow the cells. So I, I have to use my breath <laughs> during a respiratory pandemic, which is always fun, to create convex um, cells for the skin. So I blew eggshell thin glass that was silvered and silicone from the inside. Sarah Montran, my wonderful studio assistant, and I flattened all these balls to create a very large skin. And then similar to the way our skin hangs on a skeletal structure inside our bodies, we stretched this glass skin over a metal skeleton. 
and the lines of that skeleton were based on the arches of um, the Agra forts, Shish Mahal. Under our body um, and around our bones is a complex network of muscle and cartilage and um, sinew and nerves and organs. And here is a peek of what lies behind the skin, the artwork that you are about to see soon. Um, we had semi-proportional solenoids to match the pace of human breath. We had contoured, felt um, objects to ensure dispersion of that breath with subtlety across the body. Um, the wiring carried uh, current across the piece, just like arteries carry blood in our bodies, and a set of microcontroller and motorboards coordinate signals like our brains do. Um, and the person working with me on this, um, Dr. Dr. Farah Laiwala, is somewhere here in the audience. Oh, there she's hiding. Um, MD and PhD in engineering. You know, I had the best um, companion these past two years to make these connections between the human body, um, engineered parts, and the conceptual underpinnings of this lost tradition that I'm just talking in air about all the time. Um, so thank you for being here, um, and I hope you're proud. Um, on the front of the work are two eyes that sense the person standing in front of the panel, and on the back um, is a wood-burnt panel, I guess, um, and the dark outlines of this panel uh, mimic the metal skeleton that's inside. So for me, this back panel, the audience doesn't really see it, I get that, but for me it is a very silent, a very um, secret homage to the origins of the work that I am content knowing, but I thought I would share it with you this evening. Um, and where the back of this work features patterns seen in the Agra fort, the front has a cellular, wrinkly, fractured skin like our own. Um, while I worked on this piece, I started to notice details about the nature of the skin and how they could be read in relation to the tradition that it embodies. So for example, if we follow the, the small bits of blue tape that I've placed on the image on the left, we notice side profiles or silhouettes of faces. I see about three of them in that patch. Do they speak of the many, many unknown invisible artisans of the Shish Mahals? Um, the impact marks where I took the glass ball and I broke it in order to make it flexible um, very clearly show as violent and sudden interruptions, uh, like colonization or an earthquake. Um, so the fissures, which then originate from those centers and radiate outwards into these untraceable paths uh, uh, along the glass surface, would that speak about the loss of this craft vocabulary from that impact? Um, so as I've been looking at this for the last two years, and I've had a lot of time to look at it, um, I'm starting to see where these things could feature or could figure in my reading. Um, and even as I say that, I absolutely realize that the impact marks also offer breaks, like punctuations or nodes on this otherwise relentlessly reflective skin, um, like wrinkled skin on our elbow, like eyes that draw our attention to another person walking towards us, like scars on, that we notice on someone else's body. And there is a way, these, I feel like these interruptions give us a way to look past the crowd of our reflection and ask, well, how much should I move for my action or gesture to transform the skin of this other being? And conversely, how little must I move before I can look past my self-image and really notice another? So what does it mean to hold still, quiet enough, long enough, in order to transcend my own and sense the very subtle breath within another being. Sans in Urdu means breath. It's not the sort of continuous, loud, heavy, or emotional forms of breathing, but that very, um, again, <laughs> minuscule amount of air like that you need to have life force. Um, so what is our threshold for acknowledging life in something around us? Um, I'm gonna leave you with one last thought. Um, as we live, everything intrinsic to us, including our breathing, changes and in turn changes us. As this work lives its life upstairs, we are going to learn from its encounters with viewers. Um, and it is inevitable that um, its breath and its skin are going to change with time, just like all of ours do in our lives as well. 
So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Anjali. Yeah, it was so good. She asked if it was okay. It was okay, wasn't it? Yes, it was okay. Yes. <laughs> I forgot to mention before that there will also be a short Q&A after the video. So be thinking of your questions. Um, there'll be some microphones so those of you in the audience can come up and ask them. And those of you on Zoom, you can put it in the Q&A feature. Um, and now, I mean, it's hard. This piece has so much. See, I told you it has so much. I'm glad you came. I hope you're glad you came uh, to, to start to peel, peel back or pile on all those layers. Um, we're going to watch a short preview video of this in incredible documentary that our digital team, um, and under the very capable direction, in, in this case, of Brad Patoka, um, is putting together about this work. It's a, a few minutes long, um, and I... Um, want to just say, especially after Anjali, hearing Anjali talk about all the little things and all the people that are unseen and remembering uh, lives that are unseen, you know, I'm the one that gets to stand up here. But none of this happens without basically the entire museum. Like, so many people were involved in getting us to this moment. The event tonight, the people that are in the back that are running it, um, the incredible prep team and our cons and conservators that uh, really um, are an extension, I think, of uh, Anjali's collaborative way of, of working. And today, when I was standing up there and looking at the piece and thinking about this piece, is it also um, about, the, about all of the people that clean this building. The acres and acres of barrier glass, like the way that the building, you walk in it and it looks so good all the time. They are really important and they don't get to stand up here and have that moment. So those folks, I want them to, and other security folks. And now we're, and another unseen, unseen right now, but totally valuable. The museum would not be what it is um, without this man, and this video would not be what it is without this man. Um, a thank you to the late, great uh, Dr. Robert Brill, who was the museum's chief scientist for decades, and who documented things and researched things in a way that um, no one else has, and in this case, has documented some things that maybe no one else still could. So when you see the cool, oldie time footage of glass blowers in the video that's coming up. Think about the tremendous gifts of Dr. Brill that were tremendous in their time and keep giving. And with that. I struggle with describing my practice, mostly because I work in not a linear way, and I literally mean not a linear way. These places of um, cultural friction or confusion or negotiation, just things that I encounter, actually manifest in the studio in very real developments. I don't see the compartments. I only see the crossover between all the compartments. And I think that's why my objects cannot be self-sustaining, self-contained, monolithic objects. They have to be things that look to the human being for touch. They have to erode with time. They have to change. They have to do something else because they need to reach out to other things in the world in order to be themselves. Yeah, like
लग्जरी बाथरूम था टर्की सामा उस पीरियड में एक मुमताज अंदर में नहाया करती थी थाउजेंड मुमताज नहाया करती थी कैसे ये ऊपर में देखिए आप लोग वन टू थ्री आई एव फर्स्ट एक्सपीरियंस शीश महल इज अ खेड Um, I must have been ten-ish. So my first experience in the Sheesh Mahal was really standing there, going, "Wow, I'm everywhere!" And if I wave my arm, look, I'm everywhere. You know, just the magic of the optics. One, two, three. It is so overwhelming and so beautifully synchronously overwhelming to stand in the center not see yourself as one person but see yourself as a zillion billion trillion around you and then every time you move all trillion of you move um and um you recognizing that any small movement you make causes a giant wave around the room is pretty powerful i like the paradigm of that on the 26th of january this year the northwestern indian state of gujarat suffered the worst earthquake to hit india for many years tens of thousands died in the calamity and millions more lost their homes I got involved in the Sheesh Mahal um in terms of research when I went back um to India after my undergraduate degree and was trying to document oral traditions in the country. Um when I tried to go looking for those uh tribes, uh, I realized they had all been disbanded by the 2000 Lahore earthquakes that hit Gujarat. So by the time I went there, I think in 2003 or 2004, I didn't find any of these practicing artisans. I was like, I cannot believe that no one tracked these groups of people and so i started to think about ways um in which i could bring it back to life so here i am trying to bring to life a style of architecture that is completely obsolete and dead like has no warmth in it has no hands invisible hands of the artisan lives of the artisans behind it um it is obsolete it's sort of lifeless it's in the past in order to bring that to the front what what immediacy can like what what can i give it that sort of just and what came to my mind was breath You're supposed to stay over there and I'm over here okay. to try to keep us separated. That's fine. Hi. Right. We'll see how long it lasts. Um okay. So that was great, right? That was really great. Good job, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Um do y'all have questions? Come in the microphone if you would be so kind, my friend. Thank you for the very informative uh, presentation. I was looking at your video and I couldn't help but thinking of another artist that might be of similar background of yours. That is Anish Kapoor. 
I was <laughs> curious to find out if there's any connection or any inspiration that you draw because of the optical illusion. Of, I know you use different material, but uh, if you can elaborate on that, that would be great. Thanks. Sure. Um, so the thing that I appreciate about Anish Kapoor's work is um, the way he manifests the void. You know, the fact that you could stand under, I'll give you an example, the giant bean in Chicago and you go under it and you can't see yourself. I'm like, oh my God, that makes absolute sense. I, I go to this thing because it has the whole city on it and when I stand underneath it, that's completely frustrating. You did a good job of that. Um, so that is the reason I really appreciate um, his practice. Um, and I love sort of the depth in which he talks about the void. And it is something that I started to play with, but I just think that I am too, too attached to the palaces of mirrors and more interested in the metaphor of a skin and a human body than I am in the architectural or the large scale or the monolithic. And I, that would be where I would be like, you're cool, but I gotta do my own thing. So yeah, I'm, I like his work though. Anybody else? We have time for like one or two more questions and then there's a little bit of time up there, upstairs. You can also just grab me whenever or send me an email, honestly. Yeah. Sometimes questions take time to come. Can, can you say a little bit more about Shish Mahal? I, I'm, that was going to be my question too, Scott. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I no, no I'm question. so glad you asked no, it. So no, but, I, but I, I, had, I had never, uh, I wasn't familiar with it at all in, until I watched Brad's video and now obviously you've given me more information about it. But I. I'm, I'm interested in how wide, you know, how many of these temples were there and how widely spread this was. I, it's just, I'm very, it's all very new to me. Um, so I should have probably introduced the Shish Mahal by telling you what it is. Um, uh, shish means glass or mirror and Mahal means palace. So it literally is the palace of mirror. Um, so there are palaces and forts um, in South Asia where you walk into a chamber, pretty large chamber, and the walls and the ceilings are all encrusted with reflector mirrors, and they're called shish mahal. And they're called that because they have this very specific optical effect. Um, how many are there? I don't know the exact number. I know that Pakistan has got three that I know of, and India has got five that I know of, so that's eight. The, curator might know more. Um, so yeah, there's at least eight out there, but I haven't visited all of them, so. And, and who were they built by? Like when were so they built? I, I think, so Shishmal I think originally came from Persia. I think that was a route that came from there, but um, they became very um, synonymous with the Mughal dynasty. Um, so the Agra fort, whose images I showed you, um, that was built by Shah Jahan, one, one of the Mughal emperors. Um, and he actually imported the glass for that Shish Mahal from Syria and um, built those chambers. Um, but the Mughals were the people credited with sort of pushing the limits on the Shish Mahal as well as, so they would have the, the chambers, but they would also have that translucent marble, and then they would also have the patterning with semi-precious stones inlaid in it. So there was, it was a whole vocabulary, and the mirrors were sort of a part of it. It wasn't a thing in isolation. That whole oeuvre was very Mughal. And then um, the Rajputs in Rajasthan actually took some of that and then changed the patterning from geometric to more floral, and then it became a different vein of Shish Mahal. So there's some, some stories there. It's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Another artist, I, I won't, you know, if you have a question, you come up. But because there aren't questions, and we're not going to, yeah, you're going to come up. And while you're coming up, I'm going to, uh, and that will be our last question, I think. Monir. What? I That's what know. I was going to say. Oh, no, okay, never mind. I was going to say, see, it's good when we're in proximity. Another artist who makes work um, also using mirror mosaic, but that shows the kind of expanse of the, uh, the cultural 
um, specificity and expanse and relevance and resonance of this way of working is Monir Farman Farmayan, who's a Persian artist who passed away in her 90s just a couple of years ago, and is inspired in her work by the mirror palaces, which are called, well, mirror work in Persian, my terrible Persian, sorry family, is Ayena Kare. Um, incredible mirror work, um, the same sort of idea. Think Islamic architecture, the whole thing covered in mirror. But in, um, in Persia, they're very, and in Iran now, they're very um, geometric structure. And then the Mughals came to India, and, um, and India developed its own language of these things. Weren't they also flat mirror in the They are, I, I, well, having not been to them, I'm not entirely sure, but I believe that they are flat mirror. And Monir made her practice based on these flat mirror. And one of the things that's been a gift of my last couple of years is thinking about um, those two artists and another artist, Shari Deans, whose work is in our past present exhibition, and the way that these three women, um, each of who made important parts of their work in um, diaspora in the United States, used mirror and used broken mirror and used mirror and mosaic. In the case of Anjali and, and the case of Monir, both are pieces that move and change. Monir's, you can recombine them. And so to think about what it is to translate yourself across continents, across spaces, to know yourself in many contexts and to make work that move and change and that are different every time, um, you see them has been um, a real gift. Thanks, Anjali, for that. Now, over to you. That was perfect. You're tied into everything. I was just curious, is there, is there a certain religion or such that was associated with Because over on yonder, and maybe it came over and it shifted somehow, or was there a specific meaning where it was celebrated specifically by the, the people? Is it religious? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, the... The dynasties had religion, religious affiliations. But when you were going there, it wasn't like specifically, it was just for the individuals, for the creation of the celebration Oh, of the oh moment, so, right? so for, I'll give you a couple examples. So at the Agra Fort, um, the Shishmels actually, um, a, a, a court, like a, a space where the king used to meet his courtiers, so it was a public-ish space. Mm. In the Jaipur, in the Amir Fort, it is the bedroom of the queen. So I feel like the purposes are not religious, they're just different things that people, people made. Cool. I don't know, that's my understanding. Magic spaces that could bring magic, in magic any spaces. little bit of light. And like Anjali's talk where she, the part in her talk where she had the mirrored balls on the ceiling of her bedroom and it made like the starlight constellation, well, that's what that space, all of these spaces would yeah. do in the forts a transportative, transformative space. And holding that, holding the idea of transformative, transportative, let us now transport ourselves up, up the escalators, up the stairs, into the contemporary galleries and see this piece in person. Thank you all, and thank you Zoom, and thank you Anjali.